Hi, everybody, and welcome to another amazing session for BB Dev Days. So this session, we're going to be talking to Michael Fiaschetti about three data-driven strategies to re-engage your lapsed donors. So if you are like some of the hundreds, thousands of organizations I've worked with over my 17 years here, um, lapsed donors is obviously a costly thing. So Michael's going to share some strategy he has with 501 Data Solutions on uh, re-engaging with those. So, Michael, I'm going to pass it over to you, and you can drive the slides and everything. All right, awesome. Thanks, Ken. Uh, can, can you see? Can you see my screen? Can you see this? The screens, the slides. Yeah, yeah, we got you, Michael. All right, awesome. All right, well, thanks, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Fischetti, as Ken said. Uh, I am the CEO, co-founder of 501 Data Data Solutions. I am getting a really bad echo, so I need to try and fix this. Otherwise, it's going to drive me nuts. Let's see. All right, let's see if that does it. All right, so I've been in the nonprofit sector for 22 years, uh, a little bit more than that. Worked at places like Alzheimer's Association, uh, Target Software, and I'm a current board member of Compassionate Care, uh, Florida-based uh, 501c3. So today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, lapsed donors and of things that happened that make them uh, lapse at no fault of their own in some cases. So I know a lot of you do segmentation. You have RFM, file lapsed, and um, uh, um, short lapsed, you know, renewals and stuff like that. But we look at things in a data-driven way that may not be... Uh, a fault of the donor, and they may have life events uh, such as this is okay. Sorry, uh, this is the first time I've used this this gold cast, so it's a little bit a uh, little bit different. But um, so they may have financial stress. Uh, they may have marriage, divorce, deceased, moved, email changes. All these things you can find uh, by doing data repents, overlays. Uh, when you do look at wealth and uh, income, I would not replace the values that you're appending like a lot of nonprofits do. Uh, every time they get a new value, they just they, they drop the old one. But this you can look at trends of people's uh, wealth goes up or down. Uh, that may be a reason why they stop donating or they've downgraded how much they've they've uh, donate. Uh, so all these things can be uh, obtained, and you should be updating this information to see if some type of life event is what caused them to stop donating. We're actually gonna focus a little bit more on data corruption, and we'll touch a little bit on duplicate issues, uh, but mostly data corruption, and this prevents people from being communicated with that they normally would. So, um, data is complex, it's never static. The minute you load data, the minute you enter data, something else may be changing it. So we do have, obviously, manual data entry. This would be your volunteers, your uh, data entry staff, your donor services. Maybe you have providers doing data entry for you, uh, contact centers, 1-800 numbers. Uh, then you have your integrated uh, data, which would be your online forms, other systems maybe, uh, other platforms where data is feeding in. A lot of this is self-reported data. So if you give people a text field, they love to fill it up. So you'll have people enter like Michael, Melissa, Shadow, Bowski, because why shouldn't the dogs get acknowledged um, or get emails? So yeah, you'll see that a lot, and that needs to be measured and corrected and fixed. And then you have, obviously, your upload. So if you have a caging uh, uh, provider or you have uh, acquisition files, all these things that you're loading into your system through some type of bulk upload mechanism, um, there's always the possibility for data to get corrupted in that in that manner. Maybe failed shift, especially if someone has a spreadsheet, they open it, they manipulate it somehow, and then they try and load it, and now you're corrupting data, uh, possibly in that manner. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about the impact on the constituent. Everything that 501 does has a eye towards constituent experience and staff experience. Uh, so we do live in a world of now. And you all in the nonprofit sector do are at a disadvantage. You're not eBay, you're not Amazon, you're not Bank of America, you're not a, you're none of these things. So if someone moves 
or they change their email address or payment credit, you know, their credit card change, they're going to contact Amazon, right? They want their packages. They're going to contact their bank. They want their, their money to um, show up when, be in, uh, when they need it, right? So they're probably not going to contact the nonprofit. If they do, you definitely want to track that because they have a high affinity and engagement with you all. So you'd want to have some type of interaction. Or What's wrong? Yeah, because I'm actually hearing myself too, yeah, which is a little weird. So should I click the leave stage? Hello. Can you hear me still? Yeah, we can hear you, Michael. You definitely sound right. you know. much better. Yeah, because I can't hear myself yeah, talking. Yeah, there you go. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> I was I was trying to muscle through it, but yeah, this is much better. <laughs> um, sorry. So sorry about that, everyone. So yeah, so impact on the constituent, right? So really, your data is your number one asset you have. Uh, and we do live in a world now, as I was saying, people, you know, you can go purchase something at Best Buy in a second. You can go to your bank, look on the app, and you see that uh, that charge is pending, right? So everything is very constant. People have come become accustomed to that, and it's only getting worse. I don't see this happening for nonprofits in the near future, obviously, where things are that instant. But you do need to make sure that you have information gathered, easily accessible, so that when someone does call, uh, your 1-800 number or emails that your staff can give them the answers that they need, right? So um, you got to get as close to that immediate or uh, at least giving the information that they're expecting, right? You're never going to be Bank of America or, or any of these people, but you do want to have data accessible so that you can service people you want. They do want you to know them, even though they're not going to contact you in most cases, like I said, and give you the information up front. They do expect you to know them, and that's okay. We want you to know them, and we want you to honor their preferences, right? So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, I think I have another slide, but we can talk about it now, too. If someone does call your your 800, <clears throat> excuse me, your 800 number, you know, the um, your your staff instinct is to opt them out, right? If someone's angry, I'm getting so much mail from you. Uh, you know, I wish you would just stop. Well, that's not really what they're saying in a lot of cases. They may just want less mail. Maybe they don't want premiums. Maybe they only want to be communicated through through email. So getting the right code values and getting the policies and procedures in place for your staff to opt people down rather than out is key. We see this time and time again, and we help uh, some nonprofits put these policies in place and help train their staff. So, you know, I know they're eager to please, but really once you opt people out, and I've seen this when I analyze data all the time, you know, no acquisition, no exchange, no mail, no phone, no email. Well, great. How are you going to contact them, right? You just lost all ability to contact your, your volunteers, your donors, everything. So it's really important to teach people to, um, to, uh, to opt down rather than out unless someone's actually truly angry. So another data issue that prevents you and loses donors and makes them lapse, and now you really can't regain them because you opt them out. Um, again, I know it says we live in a world of now. That's intentional uh, for both slides. You know, staff has the same expectations. Now they know your internal uh, policies and procedures, but they get, they get frustrated when they can't service somebody. So uh, again, you just want to make sure that your data is consolidated, it's accurate, um, in that they have access so that they can uh, um, serve your constituents in a better fashion. So we talked about three things that you can do with the organization. Number one, most important, measure, right? You want to measure often and you want to um, you know, initially measure. So you know, until you do this, until you analyze, your data is both good and bad. You really have no idea. And so until you do this, then um, you, you can't put a plan in place to fix anything. So 
I have so many clients come to me and they think their data is horrible. They tell me, oh, my data is bad. We have so many duplicates. We don't know how we're going to fix this. Can you give us a strategy? So the first thing we do is we run it through a data quality assessment tool that we have, our software, and give them the results. Now, a lot of times these, these perceived perceptions that things are bad are not true. We actually had just did one with 3 million records. They use two Blackboard products and their data is, is some of the cleanest I've ever seen. However, they thought going into this that they were just gonna have a mess on their hands, and it's just not true. Their integrations between LO and BBCRM are super tight. They have good review in place, and they don't have a lot of data corruption happening. Um, and they don't have a lot of duplicates. So they thought they were gonna have thousands and thousands of duplicates in LO, and reality is, the dupe detection that we ran after we fixed a few things and I only brought in less than a thousand, our algorithms where we look at things a little bit differently brought in a couple thousand. So um, their data was actually very clean. I've also had customers come to me and tell me that their data is excellent. We have the best policies and procedures, but our C-suite, our, our board is making us do some type of measurement, so we're going to do this, and their data is not good, right? So they think it's good. So perception, just forget about it, right? I mean, yes, if you're looking for it, you can always find a couple data issues or when you're on a screen service and somebody, you see one, you think it's widespread, it may not be. So you need to measure uh, to really understand. And when I talk about measuring, it's really about completeness, right? So your name, address, right? Do you have zip codes populated, but no address one? Do you have an address one, but no zip code, right? There's a lot of these things are pretty fixable. USPS will give you a free zip uh, you can download it, zip code, city, state, right from their website, and you can do some some, some fixing. So as long as you have someone in-house that is a SQL developer and you have access to manipulate the data in some of these systems, then you can fix them, right? Otherwise, you may need to work with a vendor or even Blackboard, depending on what platforms you're on to do it. But um, Or you can sometimes create imports that will help you fix it. Uh, you want to look for bad characters, right? Do you have multiple consecutive spaces? Uh, I know that sounds silly, but when you're running dupe detection or you're trying to match records, you know, spaces will throw that off. If you have one, four spaces main street, and then you have another record with one main street, it's not going to, the, the match confidence isn't going to be uh, great. So no one, in, you know, usually intentionally puts multiple consecutive spaces, but we see it all the time. We see carriage returns, line feeds, um, scientific uh, uh, formulas that get, corrupted when you open Excel and then save and no one catches it and you import it. So now you have something that's completely unusable in an address one field or email field or so, so forth. Uh, you want to check, do you have data in the wrong columns? Do you have telephones and emails or emails and telephones or emails in address line one? All these things make records unusable. And they were probably good at one point, but some uploader integration overwrote that and now you can't communicate. So when I say we're looking at to re-engage with donors, it's by measuring, and then we'll talk about fixing, but fixing this data. Um, do you have conflicting data? Do you have uh, deceased date populated on some records, a deceased flag on others, but it's not consistent? That impacts how you're, uh, the constituent experience. If you're not consistently suppressing for your marketing, then you may be just looking at date, but the flag has more populated or vice versa, right? So now you may be emailing or communicating with deceased individuals, upsetting the family. So again, a poor constituent experience um, causes people to uh, to lapse out. Um, you know, my father is, is one of those uh, older gentlemen who donates to Paralyzed Veterans of America constantly. Well, something happened in the past year with his labels, and he loves his labels, is now Mr. and Mr. James Fischetti. They did something to corrupt his data, right? And he's upset about it. So um, it's the little things that you don't think about. It seems so so silly, but it's multiple prefixes, which makes the label look, in his opinion, um, not great, and now he won't use them. So it's the little things that do impact the constituent experience. And worst cases, if that um, corrupted the address line one, the, the solicitation wouldn't even get there, right? So this is what I'm talking about. Um, to really look at your data in detail, to look at these measures, to see did things happen to make a record unusable so you can no longer communicate. Uh, if you don't have the staff, then uh, you can hire companies like us or others. There's you know, some other people that do data quality assessments, they call them different thing, um, but these can be done pretty quickly. Uh, for an affordable price that gives you a very nice uh, column profile report and a data quality report so that you can see um, 
the, the quality of your data at any given moment. So those are things that you can you should be able to go back to your nonprofit and do those things. If you again, if you have SQL skills, you can write some simple SQL statements to at least get an idea of the quality of your data, or you can hire someone to do it. Very quickly, you can go in and start measuring and identifying records that you've lost contact with that may have donated in the past. Um, but you also want to have a strategy. Okay, so you want to prioritize your your data fixing um, and data updates to match your return on investment. So don't fix it all at once. There's going to be an impact. And sometimes by fixing one uh, data element, you may have to fix another one. So if you fix names, if salutations aren't triggered, you may have to fix salutations, right? So if you do a name fix to remove characters or multiple names from a first name field, if, this, if it isn't triggered to automatically update the salutations, then you're going to have to do another fix. So you really have to think through these when, you, when you're going to do uh, any type of data fixing, depending on the system and platform you're, you're on. Uh, you may also may have an integration, so it may update another system automatically or nightly when you when you do this. Um, and then you're going to want to be uh, really a, a good steward of your organization and include other um, team members, major gifts, plan gifts, uh, marketing, right? If it does have a financial impact, those are rare. Um, usually it has to do with sustaining donors. If you're doing fixing there, you obviously want to include finance. Um, but really we're talking mostly about mail ability or community uh, ability to communicate so you're going to want to make sure that you uh, include those those members of the other departments that will be impacted it could change reports it could change um, segmentation right it could change includes excludes it should change these things if you're updating data and now it's usable you also um, keep in mind that if you've had data corruption for a long time someone that is now uh, mailable or emailable or phoneable or textable may not fall into segmentation properly because they're so far lapsed. So you're going to want to include your marketing vendors. Let them know you're doing this. Um, let them know how to identify these people so that you can test getting these back into the mail stream or text campaigns uh, or email campaigns. Because uh, if you don't, you're fixing it, but you still may not pick them up. And I guarantee you, you will make money. We have done this a lot with small organizations. They make thousands. We've actually seen a large organization make over a million dollars by re-engaging and fixing data that they've lost contact with at no fault of the donor. Uh, over a two and a half year period, they re were able to uh, make $1 million in in, um, from these donors that they re-engaged with. So it does work. Um, it, it truly does. And then the other thing you want to do uh, is measure, right? You want to automate and measure. So you need to have accountability, credibility, and reportability when you do this. So you don't want to be manually running these. Again, you need to prioritize and communicate, and you want to um, automate, right? So some way of um, having these fixes on a schedule. Some of them may be one time. Maybe you find that you have bad data from one bad upload or someone uh, corrupted an Excel spreadsheet that you imported, or maybe it's from your conversion from a previous system. You know, those are one-time fixes. You still want to audit so that you can report on the um, effectiveness of that fix, and then you're going to have reoccurring fixes. Even though you've identified the issue, you may not be able to solve it. It could be that the way that the data is coming from another system, you just can't fix it before it enters your system, so you're going to run a nightly fix to fix some of these things. It's unfortunate, but you know, you're know you out at the mercy sometimes of behavior of other systems or online behavior of donors entering their own information. So uh, you will have some re, uh, reoccurring fixes. Uh, you obviously want to test, you want to automate, and you want to audit. You have to have um, audit information so that you can report on the success of this program. Uh, so you're going to want to know when it ran, what fix ran, if you have multiple fixes, you know, address, fix, line, one, whatever, you name it. Um, you have to have some type of, of ability to know when it ran, how often it ran, right? So if you're fixing the same address over and over again every month, then you know you have an issue. Something's corrupting that address every month. Uh, so you're going to want to have your incremental uh, fix. And then the way we usually do it, it's like a dot and a sequence number. Uh, to know how many times it ran, all that logs in our audit table so we can report on it and trace it back at all times. Um, so you're going to want to be accountable and um, make sure this doesn't impact other jobs either. So usually off hours, not when uh, some uploads or large imports are running and stuff like that so that you don't have conflicts within the tables. So 
uh, that's pretty much it uh, that, that I wanted to talk about. We don't really want to talk about data governance so much. I mean, I know a lot of you probably have data governance plans and you have data, uh, data lakes, uh, lake houses, data warehouses, all those things. You know, really, this is what, in my opinion, you should be focusing on first because consolidating all this data, uh, you know, not going to be super successful until you clean your data and dedupe it. We didn't talk a lot about deduping because really you need to clean it in the more standardized you have the better results you're going to have for duplicate matching so once you get your data fixed and standardized in in a good fashion your dupe detection results are going to be that much um, greater because your, your data can be compared in a, in a better format um, and then data governance is a tough one you know everyone needs it we like to talk about starting with simple policies and procedures because when you really think about data governance it all starts with taxonomy and terminology and then it goes down from there and until you you know, the best example I can usually give people is you can put, you know, five different people from an organization in a room and ask them to, to define total cost. Um, and they may or may not have the same answer, right? Or um, to describe, you know, the pieces of a source code or a fund code and all that. And they, everyone has a difference of opinion sometimes on what each thing means or segments. So you really need to define what things mean to your reporting. Um, and then you get into it. So these are things that you can do without worrying about having a full-blown data governance implementation or data warehouse implementation. You can fix these things in your database and start re-engaging with your lost uh, constituents and improve, improve that constituent experience. Um, with that, you know, a little bit about us. I didn't want to leave with it, but we have a professional services uh, consulting firm. Uh, we have years and years of experience uh, on staff. We have several FTEs and contractors that work with us. Everyone has nonprofit experience, um, a lot of them with Blackboard products, um, also Salesforce and others as well, but uh, we have extensive knowledge with, with Blackboard products as well. Um, and uh, we do a lot of data quality assessments, a lot of um, individual um, to do, um, uh, um, identity resolution and dupe detection projects as well as cross systems so if people send us data from three different systems we'll do we can do a um, individual within system and then a cross system in household level deduplication too so i will uh, stop sharing and then we can if we have any um, um have any questions yeah. we can answer those yeah i can pop them up on the screen here for you michael Mm -mm. Can you see that one from Kelly? Uh, no, we're, we're on the screen. Oh, right, yeah, I can see it now. Yeah. Can you see a little more about SQL access? Is this SQL work done within Blackboard or outside? Uh, yeah, so, I mean, some systems you do have direct SQL access to, some systems you don't. Um, you know, depending in Blackboard, if you're hosted or if you're self-hosted, um, if you host it yourself, then you have more freedom than if obviously Blackboard hosts your product, then you're probably not going to get direct SQL access. Um, we've actually worked with clients uh, for RE projects that we've created the scripts. Uh, we take a, a copy of, of the backup, cr tested it all, created the scripts, and then worked with Blackboard to execute them because we don't have direct access in some cases. So you can still accomplish this. It just might be a little bit more um, tedious, I guess, but definitely talk with your Blackboard rep if you're on a Blackboard product um, that you're trying to fix. I'm assuming you're out since you're at the Blackboard um, dev days, but uh, yeah, that's it, it really depends on the, the level of access you have to that back end to execute that, that those SQL scripts. Um, All right. Some systems have it. Yeah. All right. Here comes your next one from Mark. This is when you use the search for duplicates. We have a fuzzy match detection. Um, we actually wrote our own um, proprietary um, searching. So uh, we have multi-level searching and it, it's iterative so it doesn't stop. Um, like it picks a random account, goes through and starts grouping uh, on an individual and then a household level. Uh, and then it, it goes through and each time it adds, it takes new data elements. So if we matched and then we find a new email address after matching, then it will go back through and check to see if that email address in like the last name and, and so forth. So it's our own product that we built. Um, we've been working on it for four years and uh, it's, it's pretty flushed out at this point with individual and householding again within system and then cross system. So yeah, it's something we built um, and it's all, it's all uh, SQL, uh, SQL based. All right. 
Here's one I've always been interested in, especially as fundraising has gone more and more global and people's names obviously have tildes and all kinds of other marks in them and stuff. What available tools are there to check for special characters? Um, so I actually, we, again, everything we do is, is SQL based. So it's just from years of conversion experience that we've, uh, my business partner, Ingmar, some of you may know him. He actually worked at Blackboard for many years doing enterprise conversions for uh, BBC RM and um, for Razor's Edge. So he would be the best person. I apologize. He's not on this call to answer that. Um, but if anyone, you know, if someone does have, want to email me, um, I'll give this to, to uh, Ingmar and let him let you know. I know it's something that he built the check for these, but I'm sure there's plenty of tools out there that, that, that do this, uh, especially with a global, um, the global impact of names and, and everything. So yes, I apologize. I can't answer that question the best really well for uh, you, but we can answer. I guess it'd be hard to find Prince as symbol, right? The artist formerly known as Prince in your database, if you didn't have that. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> All right. And this is, I think this is the last question here we have from Sari. So I'll, uh, post it up here, which is our party company. Do you recommend to do a quality data assessment? How is that this different than target analytics? Well, I would recommend us. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> look, I, I know other companies offer something. It's much um, great companies out there. Um, you know, that they, they have data hygiene checking. They call it a few different things. Uh, we actually do call as a DQA data quality assessment. Um, Oz is very different than than what you would get from TAG um, and, and the others for the fact that it is more automated, but we've been, again, based on conversion where you see really bad, um, not really bad, but a lot of bad data. So it's it does everything from finding information within fields that don't belong. It does frequency distributions automatically, identifies what's a code value, what's a date, what's PII. It puts everything into nice graphs for you um, and then it gives you a detailed column profile report um, and then detailed measures right so additional measures so it will tell you um, what type of characters you have if it sh belongs there you know if you have parentheses and a phone number that's okay it's a character but we measure that like this is good right um, it also measures measures if you have email characteristics in an address and so in every field actually so it measures all these things in every field and then gives you um, um, 100 examples of each one automatically, and then the full data uh, is accessible as well with all the duplicate pairs. So we actually run as not just data quality assessment, but we actually run it and um, then automatically do a individual and household dupe detection. So you get all those counts back as well. We also standardize everything for our dupe detection. So a lot of um, what I think TAG does and, and some of the systems do doesn't do is we strip everything out and make it uniform so standardized not usps standardized but standardized for better match results so getting rid of all those uh spaces and multiple consecutive spaces and, and uh, some other standardization so uh again ours has been um honed in for for a very long time we did our first data quality assessment over four years ago and now we do these very regularly and each time we do it we improve and implement it's, it's a constant improvement so um I think we're a little bit different just because of the the value in the amount of uh, measures that we provide. Perfect. And we did have one more come in from Deborah here. So I'll pop this one on the screen for you um, if it'll pop. Do you have tools, resources to be able to do? Oops, Oops. hang on. Sorry. It went away. Right. Okay, there email, we go. Phone number checking to identify current information about a person. Maybe addresses too. Um, we do not. We usually we work with two companies. Um, to do these valid, uh, to do these now, we do get pretty aggressive rates because we send so much data. But we actually use Data Axel in sometimes Peachtree data to do these, um, to do uh, e-appends and phone verification, phone appends, and all that good stuff. So uh, there, there's definitely there's many other resources out there that do this as well. Uh, but we're happy if you wanted to give you pricing because sometimes we get better pricing than you would if you went directly to those vendors because of the volume we send uh, sorry michael it, it just ended like the session these sessions don't allow you to go over it all oh sorry <laughs> yeah 
No, no, sorry. Yeah, you got to, that last one popped up. I was getting my cue, my my wrap up cue ready to go and stuff. So, uh, if you want to post a message there in the, the message deal, they'll see it. Uh, enter a message, yeah. Yeah, sorry about that. I, I didn't know. I didn't know if you saw that up in the top in the red that it was counting down. I saw that. Yeah, this is one of the first systems I've ever had where it does that we've ever used where it's like time to time. It doesn't allow you to go over whatsoever. Free to email me and follow one data solutions dot com or text slash call seven seven four. Eight two six nine four seven one. Yeah, thank you so much for uh, letting me know how to fix that because that was driving yeah, me yeah. nuts to have, yeah, to have I, my, I hear my own voice. Yeah, I'm like I'm muffling like, through, was, man, but uh, it was bad. Well, I saw when you went in. I saw when you went in. It, like when you right when you went in, it was um, it, it showed two of you in backstage, and then when I started talking to Gabby to come in to help me. And, I, and you could hear me on stage. I'm like, okay, you're not supposed to be able to hear me talking right now. And I knew that ah, was, something was cross-wired. Okay. Yeah, hopefully that went all right. Um, yeah, no, it went great, dude. I, I loved it. I mean, my, my expertise is it with LO and Team Razor. And so data yeah. hygiene over there, data, Team Razor clients especially, data hygiene is a nightmare because you have, you know, four-year-olds, three-year-olds, whatever, in your database now because so grandma and grandpa can donate to them. And, right. Yeah. You know, it's just always a nightmare creating duplicates, and obviously, LO yeah. doesn't have household account type capability. So, yeah, I mean, I'm, I've been in yellow, uh, uh, LO for years. I mean, back when I was a Tiger Software, when Team Approach, I created. I don't even know how many ADUs in the Team Approach from LO, but um, you know, that's what I talk a lot about the combo. First name, and everyone jams in you know, a bunch of names in the first name field, right? It's just yeah. nasty stuff. And, um, you know, there's a bunch of ways to fix it. You can, you know, we, depending on the client, we have some that, you know, they want to split it out and create an import to have multiple, you know, they have each person have their own account. Other yeah. people like just keep the first one, drop the rest of them and reload, yeah. you know. So there's just, there's a million ways to do this based on the, the business rules. But yeah, LO is, is definitely a, uh, you know, oh, look, well, any, any, any self-reported system right, yeah. is, is, like, is tough. I can tell you like Coleman, like I, I work with Jim Steiner a lot. It was around Coleman and tips and th trying to help him out as much as I can. Like they were coming back and I'm like, dude, if I was Coleman at this point, I just launched a whole new instance of hello. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, yeah, it's tough. Decades, you know, decades now of just data in data out and it's who knows heads or tails you know, just start fresh who you know but whatever. you know i've i've seen really good examples of it right like i mean um the one i was just talking about was um was op smile and, yeah uh, they do a phenomenal job of keeping bbcrm and lo integrated and clean yeah i mean when we did their assessment they only had 300 combo names so i mean wow. they're like constantly i'd like, looking for these and cleaning them up themselves like it's pretty awesome the yeah, way, i was gonna ask you done that. Yeah, I was going to ask you too. I was going to ask you the question of um, what's it look like for the future of things that, you know, I've seen, you know, AP, because uh, I was a, kind of a journalism minor, major, whatever. And so AP Style Guide, I lived by that for the longest time and everything I did, the, the nonprofits I worked at and stuff in here. And then I noticed more and more the, the periods going away on uh, prefixes and stuff like mm -hmm. Mrs., Mr., things like that, and Dr. You know, the, the period is going away and I um, can imagine as that becomes within our data sets and all of our databases, you're going to have to start flexing your your tool to be able to identify a period or no period and all these other little minutia that's going to make data not match up in different places. Yeah. So that's the, that's the thing we do. Right? So we have a huge table of and I should have said this too, what makes us different, but we have a huge table of all the prefixes and suffixes and we always add to it to make them yeah. all. So it, what we consider a standard. So we do a find a replace basically. So all yeah. the variations of Mr. and Mrs. and Mr. and Mrs. and Mr. and Dr. and Dr. and yeah. Mrs. and Dr. Right. And then the other thing we do is we, we call it synonyms. Um, not everyone does this, but we have all, a lot of nickname lookups. So Mike and Michael. So a lot of systems we see, you know, yeah. Mike and Michael are Anthony and Tony. I'm a we'll Michael. Right. Well, it won't, it won't pick them up as a, 
um, as a match, right? Yeah. Anthony and Tony, yeah. Margaret and Peg, right? Yeah. So we've yeah. been we've been building this table for a long time, and every time we see something new, we go ahead yeah. and add it and add it and add it. I mean, you can find some of it online, but it's never going to be like no one wants to give that secret away, right? Yeah. You're not going to find all the nicknames and how you utilize it. So a lot of people will go up to the proper name. We actually do the opposite. We go down to the like so we take everything from all the Roberts and all that and make it Bob. Mike, Mikey, Michael, we make it Mike. We actually go yeah. down. So we're not we're not doing a replacement with it. We're doing it for lookups. Right. So we know and, and we give back both. We give back what you sent us and what we converted it to. Right. right. So uh so well, this is yeah, pretty successful. I, I'm actually in the onboarding team now. So I onboard like BBC REM, RE, NXT clients, FE NXT clients, all those LO clients and stuff. Brand yeah. new clients to Black VOD. And so, and even even people converting from RE to RE NXT, you know, that kind of yep. stuff. I do the onboarding for them. And so this is really helpful for me to know, like, of you guys, because I get some clients every now and then, like, okay, yeah, we want to do some massive data cleanup. It, can Black VOD do it? I'm like, you know, yeah, we can do it, but only to a certain degree. And so now that I've got some more information and stuff, so. Yeah, we do a lot of, we call it conversion prep. Um, so we don't, we do not convert data for people like into, like we won't do the final conversion. Right, like right. We would clean it, we would clean it and then give it to you all or whatever. So we're actually doing one right now from three systems, including Salesforce to a new CRM. So we're doing all the prep. So we're doing all the, data fixing, the data cleanup, the right. data standardization, right. and then the duplicate identification where we're loading those pairs back to the source systems, doing the merging. So by the time it gets to the new CRM, it's deduped and cleaned. Yeah. Um, and no, then we, do, awesome. we, we help, we, and we help with validation. We're not a huge fan of doing code value translations. We do it, but like, you know, usually the, whoever owned it, usually the, the consultant at the, at the company is best at it because they know, yeah. the best way to set up RE or BBCRM, right? But right. we'll give the distributions, um, and if they if they if they need us to, if they, we don't like sitting there and, and walking through it with people like, hey, you have five thousand X's. What is X? Oh, it's going to be this, and you volunteer in your new system. Um, we usually just say, oh, here's all your distributions. Go work with Blackboard to figure out what you're going to map those to. If they come back and give us the new value, we can do the update before export, but we, we try not to waste people, our time doing that. We right. like to just fix, you know? So Very that's why cool. we call it conversion prep, right? It can right. get the data in good shape for whatever the new system is. And then we can also, we export it in any format the vendor wants. Right. So if you came to us and you're like, hey, this is the layout we need for RE, for all this cleanse data, we'll give it to you exactly how you want it. Oh, very cool. I'll, to, I'll, yeah. I'll definitely make a note of that in my one note and keep keep your keep your name on file there, so I can always kind of point people your way if they're needing to just that extra love. Because um, I've yeah. had a few of them like that that's coming in. You know, you get a lot of these big affiliates and stuff for paring down now, right? They're, they're no longer having a single system for every single location. They're paring it all down and stuff, and those are becoming nightmares for some of these groups. Yeah. We um we partnered with Every Action for quite a while until they had massive layoffs um about a year and a half ago. We were doing a lot of their conversion prep for them. They yeah. were actually sending it to us because they didn't have the tools that we had and the expertise that we had, and right. the data was you know some of the data was just that bad that you know, like <laughs> you know we can't even get it into our system sometimes. Right. So so yeah, we did probably a couple dozen for them at one point. Um, so yeah, and we've do, we've done we've done some RE and black blood stuff. We actually did a huge RE fix um, for one of our clients. We fixed like thirty thousand sustaining, maybe it was more than thirty. It was a lot. It was in the tens of thousands sustaining records that were never set up correctly in RE. So they kept coming in as one-time gifts. Oh man! Um, so they were charging them an LO, but every time it would come to RE, it just looked like a one. So we actually fixed every sustaining gift they ever had, ended it if they were no longer made it look correct and had it all it's all set up correctly yeah um, that, that, no, that was part of nine, the nine months to do that that was early days of lo after black bot acquired i came from convio so that was the early days of black bot um with relo connecting to sustaining gifts and lo they came over really yank janky and stuff so it was bad back then yeah so you must know um so uh will um will hold yeah yeah, 
Yeah. yeah. Will, yeah. Will and I, we're, we're buddies, even friends on Facebook and stuff. Yeah. I keep telling him I'm going to make it out to Reno. I, I ride a Harley all over. So I'm yeah. telling him one of these, one of these years, I'm going to make it out to Reno and come see him. Uh, Noel. BB. Yeah. Noel BB. Yeah. I yeah. guess you came from uh, Alzheimer's, didn't you? So you and Noel worked here. Noel used, Noel used to be my account manager when I was at the SPCA of Texas for just a short time. Yeah. And, um, she was our professional services person when she changed teams. So yeah, Noel and I, we, we hang out when we go to BB cons and other conferences and stuff. Noel's awesome. I was surprised I never, I never met you in person. Um, me and her you, you may a, have, yeah, um, me and her presented a few times together. Yeah. Yeah. Days, I mean, so. I've been, at, I, I've only missed like two BB cons, two, two annual conferences can be uh, BB cons. I think I usually don't, conference. um, I usually don't stay. I usually like show up, speak. And leave. <laughs> no, really, I'll spend like one night and just to hang out with people that I haven't seen in a while. Yeah. So I, usually I'll, I'll, I'll like I'll fly in, I'll speak for whatever event, and then I, I head out the next morning. Yeah. No, I stay for the open bar and the free buffet and all that good well, stuff. Well, yeah, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not a bad thing either, right? So, <laughs> uh, yeah, no, who's the other uh, Will? There's, there's two Wills, one left. Who's the one that became a real estate agent? Um, oh, I don't know. Yeah, Will. Um, Will Martin? He no, he, no. Um, he's amazing. Content. I mean, let's see. Will. I don't know. I can't. It's okay. I, don't know, I have like eight <laughs> wills in my in my phone. But either way, yeah, there's some really good black bar, uh Really yeah. good. Um, really good Luminate uh, Convio people that were at that company. Yeah, they um, just they just had a a reunion. Um, I guess it was about last fall. They had a reunion in Austin. They had it the, the Friday night before I had to leave for BBCon, so I couldn't go down to Austin to it. And apparently, like, they had like a hundred people, ex Convio staff that worked there that showed up and they all mingled and everything else. And Vinay Bagat showed up at the yeah, about midway, Vinay, yeah. and he picked up the entire tab for it. Oh, that's and awesome. Stuff. Yeah, we had something special at Convio, that's for sure. Yeah, I used to enjoy working with them um, before they got bought up well yeah, I mean, I same thing happened. when i was at team when i was at target software you know i actually left the, the week that blackboard bought us i i left yeah <laughs> i did i was so pissed I, uh, I can be honest with you i really thought this was kind of the thought there for a little bit because we were taking so much business with our luminate uh you know luminate crm and stuff and yeah. uh we were really hopeful that maybe the announcement was going to be that can be because we just bought bajent over in england you know, we've, we've made some other acquisitions, strategic one up in uh, Kansas and stuff. Yeah. But we're thinking, okay, we're on this buying. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna buy BlackBot. And now all of a sudden, turn around and BlackBot was buying us. And it was just kind yeah. of, a, it was a moment for sure. We're all still wearing our black labels and in mourning over that one. But yeah, yeah, it happened. I've been here 17 years now, so you can't complain too much. Yeah, Ing Ing Ingmar stayed, and he started doing the because he used to do the team approach conversions, and then he started doing conversions to BBCRM and RE. And uh, when we got bought, I'm like, I am out of here. I, I was just more, <laughs> it was more emotional than yeah, me, yeah. you know. So I'm like, that's when I went to Alzheimer's. I, I literally just call. I basically made a phone call. I'm like, I'm looking to leave. And, I'm yeah. like, oh. and they're like, All right, we'll take you. <laughs> We well, did some uh, great stuff at Alzheimer's, that's for sure. Yeah, that we implement. I mean, I, I have staff of twenty-two, right? That's why it's tough. That's why I say if you have the staff when I'm doing these things, because not everyone has a staff of twenty-two. Oh yeah, yeah. Three, a lot of them is like so. wearing twenty-two different hats. Exactly right. So yeah. you know, we're, we're more than happy to guide people if they have their own ability. But for the you know for a short, you know, it's not inexpensive. Depends on how many records and how many systems people have. Yeah. But, I mean, for the amount of data you get back from us with an act, a plan of action, like all these things, all these priorities I talk about right. planning, you get all that from us. Like, yeah. This is what you need to do. This is the dependency. This is the order. This is who you communicate with. Like you get a full report that says, go do this, right? Yeah. Or hire us to do it. But yeah, you know, you don't have to. It's like, here's, here's your roadmap. This is what yeah. you, this is what's wrong. This is how you fix it. Yeah. And um, then you, then so. you deal with those ones who don't want to listen to your input when you're done. So. I was on yeah, Vinay's. They don't have to, you know. Hey. Yeah, I was on Vinay's consulting team when I first joined Convio. So I would, you know, go on site for one, two, three days, 
I'd draw up this huge strategy. I'd dissect their data, everything else, and do all of these plans for like sustaining gift programs and plan giving and all this other stuff. And then I'd have some of them just take it, wad it up, throw it in the trash and be like, <laughs> all right. That's right. That one just cost you 3000 bucks. I don't know what to say. But... <laughs> that was a very, very expensive piece of trash you just had. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. That's All funny. right, man. Well, I got to get ready for my next meeting and everything, but it was great meeting you. Great content yeah, you and too. stuff. And I'll, I'll, I'll see you around. All right. Sounds good. Thank you so much. All right. Take care, man. Bye-bye.